Thank you, Miss Stacy. Right there. Okay. Where did, where did I put my sermon? Hang on one second. Yeah, it'd be helpful for you to bring the sermon to the pulpit. <laughs> We'll see. All right, let's turn to Genesis 1-1. And now we've started to work our way through Genesis 1, finally, verse by verse. And we got up through verse 5 last week and day 1 of God's six-day creation. And I want to start today by giving you a summary statement from John MacArthur that gives us what the word of God in general teaches about origins. This, what I'm fixing to give you, is what I believe is the absolute truth about the origin of the universe. And I believe this is exactly what Genesis is literally describing. The eternal God, at some point in the past, Created out of nothing, without any pre-existing material, the universe as it is now in six literal days. He capped creation on the sixth day by creating man in his own image, who is intelligent, with personality, with self-consciousness, and the ability to think and to reason. This creation occurred again in six days. The seventh day it was over and God rested from creating. It occurred somewhere around 6,000 years ago. And the entire creation was mature and aged at the instant of creation. Everything was full grown. Plants, animals, stars, man, everything. At the time of creation, death did not exist. In fact, no corrupting influence of any kind existed at the time of creation. And that's why God looked at his creation and said, overall, when he got to the end, it is very good. There was no death. Therefore, there couldn't have been any animals dying, any plants dying. There couldn't have been any type of natural selection process going on. There couldn't have been any survival of the fittest happening because everything survived in that perfect and present creation. Death and corruption entered into the creation for the first time when Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God. Then came death. Then came corruption. But that is described in chapter 3. And that has nothing at all to do with the six days of creation. Later on, after the fall, the surface of the now cursed earth was reshaped drastically by a worldwide flood. It was so deep that it completely covered the mountains all over the face of the earth. It was that cataclysmic global flood that drastically reshaped the surface of the earth, which also deposited fossil beds all over the earth. The flood wiped out all of humanity with the exception of eight people and the animals in Noah's ark. They were alone, the survivors. That is the record of Genesis' account of origin in summary form. Creation, the fall, the flood, which literally reshaped, as I said, the face of the now corrupted earth after the fall. A massive judgment fell on humanity so that only eight survived. And guess what? All of us are the descendants of those eight. Every single one of us. That is the biblical Genesis record. That's what I believe. If you believe that, then you are in the club with me of a very small portion of humanity living on this earth today. Understand, most of our 7 billion or some odd 7 billion, some odd humans that are living right now on the earth 
Do not believe that account at all. We are in a small minority when you talk about all of the people of the earth and what they believe. I choose to believe in the absolute authority of the Bible as the literal word of God of the creator. And so it's real simple for me. Where do I get that opinion of that summary? I get it from the Bible. That's what I choose to believe. And science is not a hermeneutic for interpreting Genesis. Hermeneutic means a principle or a method of, 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 of interpretation, the, how we interpret things. The Bible does not bow to science. The accuracy of the Genesis text is no different than the accuracy of any other portion of Scripture. All Scripture, it claims itself, is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is God-breathed. That's the claim that it makes for itself. That's what I believe. That is what the confession of our church is here at Providence. Jesus summed it up well when he said, Your word is truth. And he's defining truth there as absolute truth. Not what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me. Absolute truth. And consider this. Since the actual origins, so, since what actually went down at the creation of the universe, since those origins are not repeatable, they are outside of the realm of science. What I mean is, since the actual origins of the universe were not observable since there was only God who was there at the beginning, guess what? Nobody can comment on origins except God. I really find it comical when evolutionary scientists tell us about what went down 20 billion years ago. Really? I mean, how in the world could anybody possibly know anything that happened millions or billions of years ago when they weren't there to observe it? What you have in Genesis, then, is the only accurate, firsthand, eyewitness account of origins by the Creator Himself. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I just find it astounding, stunning, how many serious professing Christians and pastors and theologians and Bible commentators have turned to science and to scientists to speak authoritatively on Genesis with theistic evolution. And when I say serious, let me parse that down. Understand, and I'm sure somebody's going to call me a meanie for this, but I need to state it. I don't consider the Pentecostals and Charismatics serious about the Bible. From the wacky Copeland wing, even down to the charismatic life coach pastors, so many of our watered-down churches have. I don't, I don't include them in serious biblical Christianity. They're... The literally thousands of churches that they make up in America never, ever would go anywhere near as deep as we are in our study and exposition of Genesis. They never would do this. And that fact doesn't make us smarter. That fact doesn't make us more better or more spiritual. I'm telling you it's just a fact. Those pastors preach this never-ending sermon series till the end of time of either prosperity or a watered-down prosperity of man-centered, how-to-make-your-life-better sermons with some Bible verses attached. That's the same sermon. In all, you turn it on, go on YouTube, go on TV. It's the same perpetual sermon. It's man-centered. It's about you and how you can live your better life. It's not God-centered, and it's certainly not expositional. So that's why I say I don't consider them serious. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about serious biblical 
theologians, pastors, and even well-known church leaders who deny the Genesis account as I have laid it out to you. And why? how do I say they deny it? Because they accept evolutionary science to one degree or another with theistic evolution. What they want to do is they want to mix God and evolution. They want to say, well, God cranked it up, but evolution is how it really went down because that's what science says. But listen, science has actually proven nothing that negates the Genesis record. In fact, the Genesis record is what answers the mystery of science. And another thing that makes it so stunning to me is that there is one book that is absolutely authoritative on the Genesis account. And they all have this book. And they're very aware of this book. And to me, this book settles the accuracy of the Genesis account. And that book is the New Testament. No one can get around the fact that in the New Testament, you will find there is an affirmation of the six-day creation. There is an affirmation of man being made in the image of God, Adam and Eve, not Cornelius the ape. An affirmation of the fall is given in the New Testament in very specific terms. An affirmation of the flood is given in the New Testament. In very specific terms. An affirmation of Noah. And the surviving family of Noah. All of the Genesis record. Is very carefully referred to. In the inspired New Testament. There are a large number of references. To Genesis and the creation account. In the New Testament. And in them. In every one of them. There is no attempt to defend or to explain somebody's problem with Genesis 1. It's just all simply stated as fact. And you know why? Because it is. It's fact. And I'm sorry, I can't help but give you just a few examples before we move to verse 6. And we can start with what we studied in our last book. John 1, 3. New Testament. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So that verse alone cancels the creation of anything by some random process. Everything came into being by God. There's no room for any type of evolution in that verse. Acts 4.24, toward the end, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Acts 14.15, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. And then it says next, so that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. That's ex nihilo, out of nothing. The New Testament says that God created the things which are seen, but they weren't made from anything which existed before. And we know that Genesis says he spoke everything into existence. And of course, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, have you not read that he created them from the beginning, made them male and female. They didn't evolve from an ape or earlier from a platypus. He created them male and female, fully grown. That cancels out what the theistic evolutionists say happened before you get to Adam and Eve. I can go on, I can go on, and I can go on. References from Romans about death coming through one man's sin, Adam, Peter in his epistles, 
refers specifically to the flood in a number of places and even the pre-shaped world when it was engulfed in water, Ephesians, James, many verses in Revelation that clearly declare God as creator over all things again and again and again. You can just absolutely in no way get around the testimony of the New Testament to the creation account in Genesis. And so my point is, to those who want to mix evolution and what God did is, is, to, de is to deny the Genesis 1 account of creation is to deny what the New Testament says about the Genesis 1 account of creation. You got a big problem there. A big problem. The theistic evolutionist wants to bring godless irrational, impossible evolution and impose it on Genesis and kind of match it up with God. He will say that he loves God and he will say that he hates sin, but actually he loves God a little and his academic reputation a lot. Because in most cases, that's what it comes down to being accepted by academia. Right now, from the world's perspective, the queen of sciences is naturalistic scientists from which evolution comes. They're supposed to have all the answers, but they don't. I'm here to tell you, though, that the true governing dis discipline in the matter of life in this universe at every, at every single point, is not science. I'm here to tell you that the true governing discipline is theology. The only way you will ever understand this universe that we've been talking about, the only way you will ever understand the history of man, the only way you will ever understand human behavior and why people do what they do. The only way that you'll understand the flow of life and where we came from and where we're going is when you understand true biblical theology. John MacArthur says, We cannot allow then our theology to vacate its throne at the beginning of the Bible and take a footstool while science ascends the throne. Science... And every other realm of human thought bows to the king of all disciplines. And the king of all disciplines is true theology that comes from the word of God alone. And every regenerate Christian in this world is a theologian. If you're a Christian here today, you're a theologian. Now, you might not understand all the nuances and the big words that come out of systematic theology, but you are all theologians because as a Christian, number one, you know the true and living God. You know him. And you know the means by which he is known. And you know this word of God and you read it and you study it and you, and you come on Sunday and you sit under the preaching of his word week after week. And, and, and they may view us now as anti-intellectuals. They may view us now with our belief in the Bible and a literal account of Genesis in Genesis 1. They may view us now as superstitious hicks of low intelligence clinging to our guns and our Bibles. But I'm here to tell you that there is coming a day when they will never think of us that way again. And it's coming. And it's coming soon for a lot of folks. Every day on this earth, 130,000 people step out into eternity. Every day. Okay, let's get to our text. Remember from last time on day one, in verse 2, it says, the earth was formless and void. Remember what we said that means? Desolate and uninhabited. It hadn't yet been shaped or inhabited into any living thing. And next it says, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. So at that point, the earth was completely covered with water and it was engulfed in total darkness. Now look next on day one, verse three. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning one day. So on the first day, God created the essential elements we studied of time, space, and matter, and then God added light, and he fixed the light-dark cycle in the permanent day-night continuum of 24-hour solar days. That's why it says there in verse 5, there was evening and there was morning. And again, the sun and moon have not yet been created at this point. But as I told you last week, is it really a problem for God to produce light in any form that he wants to produce it and cycle it in any way that he wants to until he attaches it to the heavenly bodies? No, it is not a problem for him. He is God. God doesn't have problems. Okay? So as we come now to day two, we have this formless and void earth, which was in darkness until light is created and fixed in the normal 24-hour day-night cycle. That's day one. Now let's go to day two. And God now continues to shape the elements into an environment. And here's his purpose. He's shaping the elements into an environment that's going to be fit for life. On this earth. But we haven't got there yet. Look at verse 6 through 8. Then God said let there be an expanse. In the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse. And separated the waters. Which were below the expanse. From the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening. And there was morning a second day. Now this is a very interesting set of verses to look into. You really do wish at this point that you could go to YouTube and see the video of exactly how this went down with your own eyeballs. But it ain't there. And you know what? Even if it was, most folks still wouldn't believe it. So all we can do is our best to try to picture in our minds what this text is describing because all of this here only happened once. It never happened again, and only God was there to see it. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is there is a series of separations by God that's happening. Day one, God separated the light from the darkness. Day two, God separated heaven from earth. Day three, as we're going to see, God separated the water on earth from the dry land. And this series of separations are done, again, as I said, in order for there to be life on this planet. Light from darkness, heaven from earth, water on earth from dry land. Now let's get into particulars. Look at verse 6. Then God said, and a reminder here, he is speaking all of this into existence. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. What in the world is this? Again, this is outside our frame of reference for anything that we have ever observed in our experience of living on earth. So you must understand, and I keep reminding you of this, this is a supernatural event. And I, and I just like this, this hermeneutic, this method of interpretation, just the straightforward uh, way of interpreting this. And here we go. On day one, the earth was covered with water. And here on day two, God separated the water into two places. And he put an expanse in between those two places. Some of the water is on earth and some of the water is now above the earth. That's just exactly what it's saying here. 
So you have the water that was still on the earth and now some of that water is separated and taken above. And in between those two elements, there is an expanse. Now, the word for expanse in the Hebrew, you know what it literally means? Expanse. It is intended, though, to convey the idea of space, of what we know with the stars and the planets, atmosphere. So as best as we can, the picture to put in our minds is of God just cutting through those waters on the earth and separating those waters into two parts. There's still that part that's spherical with water, but now there's water above it separated by this expanse. Drop down to verse 8. God called this expanse heaven. That's what we understand as the space above us. Literally in the Hebrew, it's sky or skies, that word there. It's referring to our immediate atmosphere, the blue, the thin blue line you see going around the earth. We look up at it in the daytime sky and also to the rest of space. Now, it explodes my brain to think about the fact that there was no space, the final frontier, as we know it, until this moment on the second day. And God just cut through the water on the earth. I don't know what that looked like. I mean, maybe he cut the water all the way around the sphere and the sphere got smaller in the water. I don't know. But he released some of that water and he sent it up creating space in between the waters above and the waters on the earth. I can understand that much. Now go to verse 7. Verse 7 basically just reiterates. Look what it says. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. So what is he doing there? He just repeats the same thing again, just gives us a little more detail to make sure that we're getting this because it's hard for us to picture this, and he knew it would be hard for us to picture this. Again, keep this in mind. This is a supernatural, one-time-only creative act that is really beyond our capacity to fully comprehend. Now, this separation of water above the sky has led to a whole lot of discussion and debate down through the years. And what's the primary question? Well, obviously the primary question is, what is this water that is above the expanse? What in the world is it talking about here? And the clearest answer that I've gotten from looking at multiple different views and different explanations is I have no idea. None. Maybe it could be that clear out at the end of infinite space there's water. Maybe it could be that. We know that there is water in the air. Just look back at the past three months before things got dry. Huge amount of water come down from the air when it rains. One commentary I read just gave the water cycle of rain as the explanation of this. But I think that's pretty weak when you just look at it in detail. And there's also some very interesting views of some creation scientists. Two of them, in fact, Henry Morris and John Whitcomb. I actually got to hear John Whitcomb speak a number of years ago at a conference in Pensacola on this very subject. Let me give you the real condensed version of their position. They say that the waters above the expanse were like a vapor that engulfed the whole earth all the way around. And that created a kind of a hothouse environment and they suggest that that is why animals and plants before the flood lived so long. You had reptiles living enough to become, long enough to become dinosaurs, they say. 
You had people living long enough at that time under that condition to become as old as Methuselah, 900 years old. Because why? Because they were shielded, they say, from ultraviolet light because of this water canopy above the atmosphere of the earth. And then at the flood, they say that the canopy burst loose and it drowned the whole earth along with that tectonic cataclysm that occurred under the earth with the water coming up from under the ground and then the huge amount of water coming down from above. And then after, they say, the canopy was gone, the post-flood environment of the earth was an extremely different place. And from then on, plants and animals didn't live nearly as long. And that includes man who, if you notice in the Old Testament, right after the flood, started living a normal cycle of life immediately after the flood as we know it today. Now that is a very interesting thing to study the details of. They've got books and they've got all kind of detail you can read about that. But we can't be dogmatic about that. There's nothing in this text about a water vapor canopy above the earth. It does seem like a reasonable explanation that explains a lot of other things for us. The earth at that time being like a big global greenhouse which would have maintained a uniformly pleasant warm temperature all around the world. And in that situation, they say, great air mass movements would have been inhibited. Wind storms would have been unknown. There would have been no deserts, no ice caps and this vapor canopy would have been effective as I said in filtering out ultraviolet radiation and cosmic rays and other destructive energies and then at the flood God just broke the canopy loose and since then we've all been exposed to this ultraviolet light directly and life was shortened up and we all started wrinkling up because of that when the sun hits us when we go outside and we all started living the normal life expectancy rate since then down through history. And that hadn't changed since then. Is that what really happened? It doesn't say that in the text of Genesis here that we looked at today. It just says there were waters above and waters below. That's all it says. Now there's some other good creation science who say that this canopy theory doesn't fly. Whitlaw and Brown summarized the difficulties this way. First, the heat problem. They say a large vapor canopy would so increase heat that it would roast all living things if you had no movement of air and you just have this heat. Then the light problem. Starlight, they suggest, which God said would be for signs and seasons. He did say that could have scarcely been seen and sunlight could have not been reached through sufficient heat to support tropical plants. Then there's the pressure problem. A vapor canopy holding more than 40 feet of water would increase such high pressure at its base that the temperature would exceed 220 degrees Fahrenheit, they say. And they have several other. You get the picture of what I'm saying. Who's right? What's going on here? Again, I don't know. I mean, I like the water canopy theory. But just because I like it and it neatly explains all kind of things doesn't mean that it's true. All that I know for sure, for a fact, is there was water down here and there's water up there. And that's all I know. Maybe it wasn't water like the first group of scientists said it was. And maybe it wasn't doing what the second group of scientists thought it would do if it was up there. But it was up there. Now, that's a pretty simple, non-scientific approach. But I am, after all, a full-time warehouse worker and part-time preacher. So all I can tell you is what this text is saying. Genesis just doesn't give us an explanation of the science here. It just flat doesn't. It just says some water went up and some water stayed here. Now, think about it this way. Could God have created this situation of the first group of scientists with this water canopy 
so as not to produce the ill effects that the second group of scientists said that it would. Well, of course he could have done that. He's God, right? He could have made five suns and 40 orbiting plants, planets just in this solar system if he had wanted to, and he could have made that work out environmentally perfectly if he had wanted to. My point is this, never limit what God can do. Maybe the water canopy thing is true. Water was up there, and apparently it did come down, according to Genesis 7, and drowned the whole earth in judgment, which was a frightening and horrific event with every single human being, babies, kids, toddlers, teenagers, adults, drowning to death, except Noah and his family. Now look at verse 8. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. And notice he doesn't say it was good yet. He didn't say it on day one. He didn't say it on day two. And he won't say it until verse 10 when the earth becomes habitable. Then he will say it was good only after it's finally shaped into a place where life can exist. So verse 8 ends with, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. He did it in a day. He created the heavens, the sky, and space, and now we're ready for day three. And somewhere in there, the angels were created. Do you know where? you got to come back next week to find out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Help us, Lord, to, to understand that where Scripture stops, we can go no further. We're just trying to understand the, the magnitude of this supernatural event. We believe your word. And we see with our eyeballs now the wonderment of space with as technology has increased to literally not only billions of stars, but billions of galaxies and billions of stars in those billions of galaxies. Just a mind-boggling display of your glory. And we give you all the glory for it. Because we... Certainly in the minority report of all human beings on this planet, we believe in your book. And we believe in the literal account of Genesis 1. Because you said it. You inspired Moses to write it down. And we believe it. How we thank you for the wonderment of your story. Your account of how you created the world and all things in it. We give you Praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you stand with me, we'll close by singing Rock of Ages.